Hi, it's Jeff Cohen from the Florida Healthcare Law Firm. I want to talk to you today about the uh, Autonomous Practice Act that passed for nurse practitioners in Florida effective July 1. You'll see um, some slides that go along with my presentation, and you're welcome to get them on the back end of the presentation. Just email me. Happy to get them to you. Figure out how to get these slides going. Okay. Autonomous practice is eligible, is, is, um, is, is something that a qualified advanced practitioner um, can, uh, can obtain in Florida, but it doesn't apply to everything. It only applies to the practice of primary care, family medicine, general pediatrics, general internal medicine, and midwifery. And again, Independent practice or autonomous practice just means you don't need a supervising physician. So the two critical things to keep in mind here is, are number one, you don't need a supervising physician. And number two, it's only uh, applicable to the areas of primary care. What do you need to become an autonomous practicing nurse practitioner? You need an unencumbered license. You need no disciplinary actions within five years of the application. You have to have at least 3,000 clinical practice hours within five years of applying to be an autonomous practicing NP. And within five years of the application, you have to have completed three graduate level semester hours or the equivalent in differential diagnosis and the same in pharmacology. What else? Well, you need to have financial financial responsibility uh, via professional liability insurance with limits of 100, 300. That's 100 per claim, $300,000 in the annual aggregate, or an irrevocable letter of credit. But there's some exceptions to the financial responsibility requirement. If you're working for the federal or state government, you don't need it. If your license is, is inactive and you're not practicing, you don't need it. If you're practicing only in conjunction with teaching duties, you don't need it. Or if you're not engaged in autonomous practice, that is practicing with an autonomous certificate that exempts you from the supervising physician requirements of being a nurse practitioner, then you don't need it. Once you get the license, the autonomous practice NP license, it's good for two years. To renew it, you're going to need 10 hours of CEUs plus an additional 30 hours established by the board. Now, one of the things you're going to notice about this law is this. The law was passed. It's effective July 1. It says what it says. But like every other law, there's rulemaking authority that the Board of Nursing will implement that may be more specific and even surprising. So it's common for the rulemaking process to come up with requirements and limitations and explanations and applications of that law that might be interesting, surprising, good or bad for you. So we'll have to pay close attention to the rulemaking process over the next few months. Okay, so let's say you've apl you've applied for uh, to be an independent, what it's actually technically called, autonomous practicing NP. What can you do? Well, once you're licensed, you can practice in the area of primary care without physician supervision. That's it. Primary care, physician supervision. If you require the services of a healthcare facility, you might be interested to know that you, by statute now, can admit the patient, but you got to get privileges. We'll talk about that. You can manage the patient's care in the facility. You can discharge the patient from the facility unless prohibited by some other law. You can provide a signature, certification, stamp, verification, affidavit, or endorsement that would otherwise be provided by a physician. So 
what's it mean to have privileges? Now, for those of you who've been on staff at a surgery center or a hospital or a gastro lab, you'll know that you have to go through a certain application process. You have to apply, apply for privileges. Typically, you'll find that process described in what's called the AHP section of the uh, bylaws of that facility, the allied health professional or health practitioner section. That applies to people, MPs, other typical, typical level practitioners. Uh, and currently do if you have those privileges allows you a signature. Prior to this, you would have to wait for the physician to do. The requirement of the contemporaneous attestation requirement that is typically found in hospitals and surgery centers and the like will now get downloaded to you. Uh, that's good news, bad news. It gives you some autonomy, but it also will expose you to disciplinary action. Because if you don't do the contain, contemporaneous attestation that's required by federal and state law, then you can have your privileges suspended or even revoked. All of that is going to be described in the medical staff bylaws of the facilities where you're on staff. So the net effect here with respect to the facilities uh, provisions is that it's going to make you have to be more aware of, mindful of, the written provisions of the rules and regs, policies and procedures of those facilities. How about other specific requirements and prohibitions? If you're a certified nurse midwife, remember you can also um, be an independent practitioner or as, you know, as the uh, law says. Um, but you need a patient transfer agreement with the hospital and also a referral agreement with the physician. So this is an area where the physician uh, supervision is going to attach and remain in place. You also have to provide information to any patient about your qualifications and the nature of autonomous practice before or during the initial patient encounter. It would not work for you to establish the physician, the, uh, the uh, uh, clinical relationship with your patient and somewhere after the initial encounter say, oh, by the way. So you're going to want to let them know initially when you establish the relationship and you should even have a form that is completed by the patient so that it's clear that the patient understands that your autonomous practice MP, and they're consenting to it in writing and date that. What other specific requirements or prohibitions? Autonomous practicing NPs may not perform any surgical procedure other than a subcutaneous procedure. What else? An insurance company can't require a patient to treat with an autonomous practicing NP in place of a physician. Let's talk about adverse incident reporting requirements. This is something that physicians have been traditionally very familiar with, and if you've been practicing in the area of risk management, then you're also familiar with it. An adverse incident report means the an extent over which the, uh, the uh, NP could exercise control and which is associated in whole or in part with a nursing intervention rather than the condition for which the intervention occurred. And that intervention results in a patient transfer to a hospital, permanent physical injury to the patient, or patient's death. If you work in a facility, especially in the uh, QA field, you'll understand that this is something very much akin to what we call a code 15 report. You now have adverse incident reporting responsibility. 
as an in independent practicing, pra practicing NP. What are the adverse incident reporting requirements? Well, here you go. They have to be reported by the autonomous practicing NP to the Department of Health. It has to be reported within 15 days of the adverse incident. If the patient isn't in the APRN's direct care, it's 15 days from the date the incident was discovered or reasonably should have been. But try to keep this in mind um, in, in your own mind and take responsibility for it because if the time, if the um, incident isn't reported in a timely way, then it's your ability to independently practice that's at risk and at stake. As a rule of thumb, if things don't go as planned and that patient ends up in a, in, in a hospital when that's not what they were, that's not what you were treating them for, you have 15 days to report that adverse incident to the Department of Health. Take responsibility for that. Do not let somebody else take responsibility for it and just rely on their word to you that it's being handled. One of the things that autonomous practicing NPs are going to encounter is strange healthcare laws. They're strange because while they've been around for a long time, you haven't had to focus on them, take responsibility for complying with them, or had any direct responsibility relative to those laws. In fact, you've been on somebody else's ship, if you will, either in a practice or working at a facility, and the leader of the practice, the leaders of the practice, or the facility took responsibility for knowing those laws complying with them and uh, and that sort of thing. But now that you're an autonomous practice NP, you can't do that anymore. So you need to take charge of making sure that you're aware of these laws because you're practicing again without a physician's direct supervision or even pursuant to a protocol, right? You're practicing independently. So in some sense, you are now taking the reins of regulatory compliance into your own hands in the field of primary care and nurse midwifery. Let's talk briefly about those laws. I don't want to drown you in the details, but I'll give you a working awareness of them so that when you're walking around uh, practicing and, and, and perhaps having your own business and what have you, you can be at least aware of the general existence of these laws and what they pertain to. The Florida Patient Self-Referral Act of 1992. This is probably the most pertinent law that prohibits NPs from owning and referring to any provider of a designated health service. You may have heard about the Stark Law. Well, the Stark Law is the federal uncle, if you will, of the Florida version. And what it generally prohibit, pro prohibits is a physician from owning and referring to any provider of designated health services. Well, you'd have to know what DHS or designated health services is, but it includes physical therapy, rehab, diagnostic imaging, clinical lab, DME, home health, um, and a variety of other uh, services and items. Bottom line is if you're going to have an ownership interest in anything outside the hands-on practice of nurse practitioner, on anything in the healthcare space that provides healthcare services or items, make sure that they comply with the Florida Patient Self-Referral Act. You're gonna to wanna to know, is what I'm providing, the service or the item, is it a designated health service? And then if it is, are you allowed to own it in the structure that you planned, is there some exception that applies? Because there often is. The most prominent exception to the Florida Patient Self-Referral Act is the same one that we find at, at the federal level under the Stark Law. So if you've noticed, for example, in orthopedic practice, you'll see 
Many of them have physical therapy, diagnostic imaging, DME, pharmacy, and some other items that typically fall under the definition of a designated health service, a DHS. And you might, in the course of your studies and in your uh, CEUs, hear about these strange laws, Stark and the Florida Patient Self-Referral Act, and you might ask yourself, well, how is it that these medical practices, these physicians, can own and refer to businesses that provide these services? Well, there's one prominent exception. It's what we call the group practice exception. But it only applies when your business is only providing DHS to your own patients. So let's say you have you form a, a practice and you call it um, independent NP practice, Inc. OK, let's say you form the company and the company is going to provide physical therapy, diagnostic imaging, uh, DMA. Let's just pick those. Those are classic designated health services under either the Florida law or the federal law. So we know, if we go back to the beginning of this presentation, that your autonomous practice scope only applies to what? Primary care. Does it apply to DME? No. How about the practice of physical therapy? No. So we know that there's a limitation in that regard. but. Perhaps you have a primary care practice that does these other things because is it possible for you to do that? Yes, you'd have an autonomous practice that applies to primary care, but you're providing other things for which physician supervision and a physician protocol is required. Is that permitted? It is permitted. It just part of it falls under the autonomous practice law and part of it doesn't. So how is it that those physicians can have those practices that provide DHS, this group practice exception, and you'd have to mimic the same exception. You'd have to meet it. The recipients of the DHS, the patients that get it, have to be patients of your, of your practice. You or another NP in your practice has to be physically present in the office when, you, when they receive those services. So those are one law to keep in, in, in mind as you begin to navigate this law and imagine what your professional future might look like if you were autonomously practicing. How about another one? Here's another big law, the kickback law. How many of you heard of kickbacks and fee splitting and things like that? They're really common in the language for physicians and healthcare facilities. They're less common in the mindset of autonomous of uh, excuse me of NPs because NPs have typically hitched their cart to the wagon of a facility or medical practice. But now that you can practice autonomously in the area of primary care, you're going to need to know this because you're going to be making more and more independent uh, and and business decisions. So what's a kickback? You may have heard about the anti-kickback statute. Uh, that's the big law. Uh, it's a federal law and it has criminal consequences if you get it wrong. So what's a kickback? It's paying somebody anything of any value at all, not just money, in exchange for a patient referral or generating business for your practice. So if you've got money or something of value going from you to anybody, and that same person or business refers you patients or generates business for your practice, you have a kickback issue. Is there a kickback violation? Maybe. I say maybe because there's a whole bunch of, uh, well, there's one big exception and there's a bunch of examples of permissible arrangements called safe harbors. You may have heard the term safe harbors. Safe harbors attaches to the, war, to the phrase kickback or anti-kickback statute. Safe harbors are regulatory examples of permissible business arrangements between healthcare professionals. So for example, you might have a medical director and you might send patients to that, excuse me, that, that medical director might, let's say be 
a geriatric physician and, and not do family medicine, and you've gotten into the business of you've created your own business, and now you're on autonomous practicing and P doing family medicine, and you've cleared the hurdles, you've gotten your license, and you have this relationship with a geri geriatric medicine physician, and that physician sends you patients because sometimes his or her patients need primary care. So those patients come over to you. And you say, you know what, I'd like to pay you for doing that. Can that be done? No, because it would be a kickback. Violation of the state kickback laws and also the federal ones. And then you might say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a medical director. Well, is that permissible? It can be, but not if the reason for doing it is to say thank you for referring me patients. No way, no way around it. But if there was a legitimate reason for you to have a medical director because you want to make sure that your policies and procedures and your protocols are top drawer and you just you, you just think it lends credence and value uh, to your business and maybe distinguishes you from another um, independent practicing NP. Okay, is there a way to do it? Well, you'd, you'd look through the safe harbors, or you, your lawyer would, and you'd find out that there's a safe harbor for just that kind of arrangement. It's an independent contractor type arrangement typically, and it's called the Personal Services Arrangement and Management Contract Safe Harbor, also known as PSA for short. What about if you wanted to employ somebody as a marketer for your practice? Their job is to generate business for your practice, right? Well, sure. Well, can you pay them? You can pay them if it's done properly. There's an exception to this law, the bona fide employee exception. This is a W-2 employee over whom you have direction, supervision, control, there's the PSA exception. So there's ways to get that done if it's a legitimate arrangement and if it's meticulously papered up pursuant to the requirements of that federal and state law. Even lease, leasing space, believe it or not, let's say you go into somebody's uh, uh, building and the building is a physician that you've got a great relationship with, medical practice, you have a great relationship with the practice, they have an open suite, and you've decided you wanna have an autonomous practice and open your business in that, in that suite. Is that permissible if it's owned by a physician or a medical practice that sends you business or that you send business to? It is, and it has to be done properly. There are requirements of those safe harbors, which are very specific. For example, they have to be in writing. These arrangements have to be in writing. They have to accurately describe the relationship. They have to have a duration of a, not less than 12 months, and so on and so forth. I don't want to drown you in the details of these things, but it's incredibly important. But to give you an idea, I'll get into the details of a bona fide employee. Let's say you were going to bring on board a uh, somebody that's going to work with your business, your new business, 25 hours a week, and you want to make them a, a, w, a bona fide employee. So you withhold taxes, they're a W-2 employee, and you also direct, supervise, and control them, and all that stuff. So it's permissible if there's a need for those services, if there's a written contract. Here's probably the more difficult um, and creative thing that you have to focus on is how you pay people, how you pay people for performing services, whether they're an independent contractor or a W-2 employee. Compensation has to be set in advance and not vary based on the value or volume of business generated or patients referred. And the compensation has to be consistent with fair market value. Believe it or not, one of the ways is, that's common for healthcare businesses to ensure compliance with some of these these elements for the exception, the bona fide employee exception, is to have a firm independently fair market value what's being paid. It's a much more complex uh, process and arrangement than you otherwise might think. But once you start your autonomous business and you begin to take responsibility 
responsibility for ensuring compliance with these laws, you will quickly become a master of them as you engage with them. It will become second nature and words like stark and kickback and fee splitting and bona fide employee and personal services arrangement, those things will begin to pop up in your head very, very naturally. It just takes a little bit of, of exposure and education. Space lease is kind of a funny thing. So I gave you the example where you know a physician or the medical practice, you get a good relationship and they get an open suite and you'd like to lease the space. Well, you actually have to need the space, which is kind of a funny thing to say because you'd normally think, well, why would I pay anybody for space that I don't even need? And I'll tell you why. Some people, the, the regulators fear, might pay a physician in this situation for space simply as a way to thank the physician for referring them patients or generating business. You see where we're going again, back to the kickback realm. So you have to need the space. You can't just lease it from them, give them a check for a thousand bucks a month and say, thanks very much for, for uh, leasing me the space that I don't need. That's not gonna work from a kickback perspective and it's not safe harbor compliant. And again, uh, some of the details I might have skipped over real quick. Uh, there's got to be a written contract specifying the space lease. If it's part time, the intervals of lease uh, of use, I'm just going to use it nine to 12, three days a week. The lease amount has to be set in advance, not vary based on the value or volume of patients referred or business generated. Percentage based compensation arrangements, percentage based payment arrangements are highly highly suspect from a kickback perspective. Anytime somebody's asking you to pay them on a percentage basis, you need help navigating that because it's probably the highest risk way of compensating anyone for anything in the healthcare sector. Does it mean that it's always illegal? It doesn't, but it is a tricky and higher risk uh, form of business arrangement and you need to have somebody walk you through it, educate you, and then they should show you three things. The laws, the options, and the risks of each option. The decision about what risk tolerance you have, whether it's a level one, two, three, four, or five, that's your decision as a business person, but you always must know before you get into a business arrangement or a business relationship, what are the laws, what are the options, what are the risks? The lease amount has to be consistent with fair market value and compensation, again, or lease payments. Anytime there's money exchanged in the healthcare sector and it's percentage based, very high risk, you have to have a conversation with somebody that navigates that every day. Fee splitting. Let's talk about fee splitting. You probably heard that um, and uh, people are kind of confused about what that, need, what, that, what that phrase means. And the best way I can describe it from looking at all the cases that date back to 1992 um, is this. The classic fee splitting arrangement, according to the Board of Medicine, arises when a physician joins the practice and the practice gives the physician all of that physician's patients and then pays the physician a percentage of what's collected for what the doctor does. That, according to the Board of Medicine, is a classic fee split. So anytime you have that collection of facts, you have to ask yourself with help, okay, how likely would this be viewed as a fee splitting? And what's the likelihood of having problem with that uh, with the Board of Nursing? Those are things that you have to uh, take a look at. There's some language in some of these opinions that suggests that there's a way to do this on not a no risk basis, but a somewhat low risk basis. If, for example, the percentage split bad word to use when we're talking about fee splitting. But if in fact the percentage split 
is related to the actual expenses incurred by the practice. Bottom line, if you're going to pay a percentage based compensation to a professional, another NP, an RN, a physician, you have to make sure that you understand what the law, the options and the risks are with your compensation arrangement. It is certainly not black and white. It is absolutely a function of navigating the risk spectrum, being aware of it and deciding what you're most comfortable with. NPs are going to, uh, th that want to enter the autonomous practice space are going to have to um, uh, do at least these three things. Be familiar with the laws, especially the rules that come after the effective date of the law, which was 7-1-2020. Uh, You're going to have to form a legal entity through which you want to practice. You're going to want to get insurance or a letter of credit, an irrevocable letter of credit in place. And of course, you're going to have to apply to be an autonomous practicing NP. You're also going to want to get a realistic picture of how much money you're going to need to get started and get your financing in place. And of course, as a general rule, as you can imagine, good tip, overestimate your expenses, underestimate your income. OK. Um, if you're going to move in this direction, you have to approach it as a business person would, and you have to have an idea of your operating capital needs. You're going to have to know things like, well, how long will it take to get cash flow into this business? You're going to have to get applications in to be on um, in network, if you will, with uh, health insurance companies very quick, right? Because Family medicine, primary care in Florida, in most places, is heavily penetrated by PPOs and HMOs. And the way that you get on there is you fill out an application to be a participating provider. And it can often take months to get uh, on panel. And when you're on panel or in network with these insurers, the patient's copayment and deductible is reduced. If you're out of network, it means you don't have a participating provider agreement with the payer, then the cost to the patient is higher. They tend to have higher copays, higher deductibles, higher patient responsibility requirements, which generally favors um, practitioners, whether they're physicians or NPs or whatever, being in network, in an environment, in a, a geography that's heavily penetrated by managed care. If, however, your where you want to practice uh, primary care is largely a Medicare patient population, well, that's going to be much easier, much easier, because you can very quickly become a Medicare provider and, and drop your application and begin billing and collecting very, very quickly. In fact, usually a lot quicker than commercial insurance. So. As part of your business plan, you have to factor in, are we going to be, are, are, are we going to want to be in network with a bunch of managed care payers? If so, you're going to need to give yourself more time to apply and get in network. The other thing to think about is this. What entity do you want to practice with? Now, if you're going to form it yourself and you're going to be the only owner, no big deal. That's very simple. Just as formed, uh, it's an LLC or it's a PA or an Inc. Um, we'll help you navigate that and pick one. It's literally a process that just takes a few days and then your accountant gets a tax ID number for it and you're ready to go. But if you have investors or you have other owners, that process takes longer, right? because you're gonna need a shareholder agreement or an operating agreement or something like that. So again, when you put your plan together, meet with the lawyer, your legal advisors, and also your accountant to put together a good game plan. It doesn't happen overnight, even for a, a business that you're gonna own by yourself. It's gonna take time, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure 
that you give yourself plenty of time so that when you open the doors and your obligation to start paying for the lease of the space that you just rented, um, when that obligation is front and center, you don't have to worry about it because you planned and you now know all the landmines and you've got your Medicare application. It's through your application to insurance companies it is in and you're on network so you can begin taking care of those patients immediately. Otherwise, what? You have to sit there and wait, right? One of the other things that I didn't put in the slides, but I'll mention, is the possible need for a healthcare clinic license. Uh, Florida has an, is an odd little law, and it's not a national law. It is a Florida law. That any business in Florida that's going to provide any healthcare item or service and submit claims for reimbursement to an insurance company has to have a healthcare clinic license unless, unless what? Unless an exception applies. The most common exception is the business that provides the healthcare item or service is, generally speaking, just owned by healthcare providers. It's just owned by you. It's just by, owned by um, um, autonomous practicing NPs. But what if you, it was uh, autonomous practicing NP and somebody that was going to loan you the money to start up or invest the money and become an owner with you and that person isn't a healthcare professional, that person is just a business person. You're going to need a healthcare clinic license. That takes generally 90 days to get. So putting this all together, you got to know the laws, you got to plan, you got to give yourself time. And before you incur any financial obligations that are ongoing, make sure that you have a great game plan in place so that you can get as successful as fast as you possibly can, because that's what's going to allow you to treat as many patients for as long as you want. Okay, you've got my contact information. This is actually Jeff, not David, but David sounds a lot like me. Actually, actually, he sounds better than me. Anyway, you've got his contact information here. I wish you all the best, and we're very excited to help you uh, navigate this process and, and build whatever you're inspired to create. Thank you.